new series uh, led by Brother Quinton. Uh, we'll begin by singing hymn number 608, hymn 608. We'll sing the first and the third stanza. <clears throat> Ready? He took my burdens all away up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. In my heart joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lived on me. Sin and up. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. I am redeemed no more to die. <coughs> Goodbye. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. And some of these days in death and land, sing with a chorus grand. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lived on me. Sin and up. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. Next, to sing hymn number 92. Hymn 92. We will sing the first and the third stanza. <clears throat> Ready? Glorious things of thee are spoken, Sion city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken, form thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shame thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou mayest smile at all thy foes. Saviour, sin, Zion city, I true grace a member. Let the world thee ride of pity, I will glory in thy name. Faithing is the worldling's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show. Solid joys and lasting treasure, None but Zion's children know. Next to sing hymn number 164. Hymn 164. <clears throat> Emmanuel, Emmanuel, His name. Sing him number one zero zero five. Him one zero zero five. 
Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving a light for those who long have gone, and guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Oh, give us the light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star, the hope of rest, for the redeemed, the good, the blessed. Yonder in glory when the crown is worn. For Jesus is now the star divine, brighter and brighter he will shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, Shine upon us until the glory dawn. Oh, give us the light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. We'll sing one more hymn, hymn 718. And after singing this hymn, we'll look upon to uh, Brother Trevor, if you would, to lead us in the opening prayer. Hymn 718. <coughs> We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into His presence. We bring an offering of song. Glory and honor and dominion. Unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. Brother Trevor. Bow and pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day you've blessed us with. We thank you that we can come in prayer to you, knowing that um, you are our, our Father and that um, we've been blessed as Christians to have this opportunity of prayer and uh, to know that you uh, care for us and uh, that you will hear our prayers and that we can bring our petitions and requests before you. We uh, pray that uh, you will be uh, with us. Um, and uh, we pray that we will be uh, attentive to the things that are taught as we begin this new uh, series this evening and that we may um, seek to um, think upon the things that are taught and to apply our lessons that we can learn from it uh, in our lives to um, live our lives as you would have us to. And uh, we pray that you'll be with the congregation here. Pray that uh, it may uh, be strong and that it may grow and that... Um, for those who are not here with us this evening, uh, for whatever reason, we pray that you'll look after them and uh, we pray that we may be able to uh, meet with them soon. We ask that you'll please be with us now and we pray these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Alright, just give me a second while I fight with my computer. go. Alrighty. Warm welcome to everyone this evening and as you can see we're going to be looking at Matthew. So the thought process was we just looked at the first book of the Old Testament and um, I'll keep a spreadsheet of everything that we've um, looked at and studied over the years and I noticed we had never looked at Matthew that I could find. So I thought well we just looked at the first book of the Old Testament. Let's look at the first book of of the New Testament. So we're looking at Matthew um, for the coming weeks ahead and this evening is pretty much just an introduction before we jump into chapter 1 and um, we should just get through the introduction and if it goes really quick then I will uh, just go through the first 17 verses which is pretty much it just opens with the genealogy of Christ. So Interesting facts about the Gospel of Matthew, to start off with. Matthew was primarily written for a Jewish audience. I'm sure most of you already knew that from the beginning. Matthew paints a picture of Jesus as undeniably a Jewish man descending directly from Abraham. And um, he was the reason for this is that obviously Abraham was the patriarch of the Jews. We see in numerous times in Matthew... Jesus referring to uh, Abraham as their father or as not their father at least, um, especially the Pharisees when they were um, having a one-on-one -on -one with him. And the reason why that was so important to the Jews is because obviously Abraham was from whom the promise would come. And that's also why the book opens up with this genealogy. Um, and in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1, in fact, even today when I was cycling, I'm, I'm busy going through Genesis coincidentally, and um, I was thinking, you know, in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning was the, uh, sorry, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens, the earth. And I thought, oh, I wonder why the New Testament didn't start with John. How cool would that be? In the beginning was the word. You've got two testaments, the two, the two testaments, uh, starting with the phrase in the beginning. But Matthew starts off with the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And we're going to sort of touch on that a little bit later on. So the book is packed with allusions to the Old Testament that um, the Gentiles wouldn't notice. Another reason why we um, can most likely and accurately assume that Matthew was written for a Jewish audience. And Matthew frequently calls out the connection between Jesus' actions and Jewish prophecy. And uh, uh, while the other Gospels frequently use the phrase the kingdom of God, Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. And I actually never knew this until doing this very study. The reason that's so significant is because the Jews placed a great, uh, amount, a great importance and a great value on the name of God and the name God and the word God. And so to just use the kingdom of God in a far more familiar term as what we use it today, um, that could have been confronting to, uh, lead, to especially your conservative Jews. The Gospel of Matthew is also the only book to point out that Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Again, something that would have been very important to the Jews and especially the conservative Jews. Another interesting fact, uh, the symbol of Matthew. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that at least most of you would have known that the four Gospels um, have a sort of symbol associated with them and that sort of comes from Catholic tradition. So here's a general knowledge question for you if you ever get asked it. Uh, church camp quiz is coming up, you never know. Uh, the, symbol of God, the symbol for the Gospel of Matthew is a winged man. Um, and this theory comes from the 2nd century, as I said, it's a Catholic tradition. Uh, Since Arrhenius Famia associated the symbols from Ezekiel and Revelation with each of the four Gospels. Um, and he just suggested that Matthew was the winged man because it was Jewish tradition and uh, also the fact that it presents Jesus as the Messiah uh, through Abraham and through David. Uh, John, for example, really presents Jesus as, as the divine Messiah, whereas 
Jesus more, sorry, Matthew more relates Jesus as a fellow Jew, but the Son of God, ultimately fulfilling the prophecies through Abraham. The book contains more than 130 Old Testament quotes and illustrations, and as Jesus speaks, performs miracles, and makes decisions, uh, the Gospel of Matthew highlights um, this over and over again, and how his prophecies, how his works, actions, and deeds all reflected, all reflect Old Testament prophecies. Uh, so Matthew uses two phrases that no other gospel uses. Anyone want to hazard a guess what those two gospels are? Sorry, what those two phrases are? Anyone? I did give you one. That's very good. So Walter knows the answer to one, which was? Kingdom of heaven. Yes, that's right. So what's the other one? Very good. Well picked up, Walter. What's the other one? It's actually quite a long one. I would never have known. That which was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. That's a long phrase. But really, again, emphasizing the, the fact of Matthew's Jewish audience. And he uses this phrase quite regularly through, through the book as we go through it. Uh, Matthew introduces Jesus as the Messiah. To a modern reader, Matthew's frequent interjections and references to the Old uh, Testament may seem to slow down the action. But Matthew is deliberately connecting the Old Testament to the New Testament, and specifically the prophecies to Jesus, showing that he is the Messiah, the one who was promised, the long-awaited king, ultimately uh, from the seed of Abraham and the son of David. Matthew is the only gospel that mentions the Magi, or the wise men at Christ's birth, and commonly known as the three wise men, and, and I know we've spoken about this a few times through other uh, studies that we've done, it's not three written anywhere in the Bible is basically the three wise men because of the three gifts that were given. Oh, yeah, there you go. That's what that one says. Um, this I found very interesting. I didn't know this. More, fr more papyrus fragments exist today for Matthew than any other New Testament book besides John. So Matthew was a very popular and widespread gospel in the early church. All right. So some quick q and I thought just to wake us all up again. Um, what was or is Matthew also known by? Levi. Levi. Very good. Too quick. What does Matthew mean? You know what Matthew means? We don't have a Matthew in the congregation. I'm pretty sure most of the Matthews out there know what it means. Anyone want to take a flyer? Anyone with electronic Bibles, the little A or link next to it? All right. Matthew means gift of the Lord, apparently. <laughs> what was Matthew's profession? Easy one. Tax collector. Yes, tax collector. Right, and that's important. So I specifically threw that one in there because of something we're going to look at a little bit later. So here's one that we're going to look at this evening. Why is Matthew the first of the four Gospels? I was actually thinking about this today and I thought, I've got to put this in my lesson. Why is he number one? I mean, we just said, or well, wouldn't it have been cool if John was number one? I would argue it's, um, it's like a, a, a good continuation from the Old Testament to the New Testament, so it's causing a lot of the Old Testament. All right, yep. So that, that actually is a very common reason given by commentators. Um, not the most common, but definitely I'd say that is the second most common reason that I've found. For those of you who didn't hear Lily, um, a, a, an idea that's presented quite, quite regularly is the fact that it's number one because of the amount of Old Testament uh, quotes and throwbacks. And so it's a good segue from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So that is one reason that some commentators give. All right, anyone else have any ideas? All right, so um, I'm going to stick with this one. Um, and again, I'll... I'll speak to it a bit later on as well. Um, a lot of uh, tradition, church tradition, and, and historical writings about the book from sort of your first and second century commentators uh, say that Matthew was the first gospel written, not the first book of the New Testament, but the first gospel that was written. And one commentator goes so far as to say, well, this should be a logical conclusion because he was the most likely to have had access to parchment because he was a tax collector his job involved keeping records 
um, and, and basically balancing the books. So in his profession, he would have had paper and pen, it's assumed. I know he didn't have a smartphone, I know he didn't have a computer, um, but I don't necessarily know that that's how he kept his records, but anyways, this commentator says, oh, it's obvious he was the first one to write it because he was the first one to have paper. How obvious or not, I don't know that is, but I found it was an interesting point nonetheless. I'd never considered the fact that, you know, all the other, well, the majority of the other apostles were fishermen, and um, Matthew is the apostle that had, was deemed by some commentators to be the most educated, being an apostle, uh, being a tax collector, being someone with an education, being someone who liaised with both the Roman and the Jewish government and people. Um, also, traditionally, it's placed first in almost every single manuscript that, is, that has been found. Um, I couldn't find out which ones it's not placed first in, uh, but, the gen but the comment is made in a couple of commentaries that it is placed in the traditional assembling of the New Testament. It's placed first in almost, to use the words of the commentator, in almost every single combination of the New Testaments it's found to be first. All right, so here's another sort of a trick question. Anyone know why we attribute, because I'm not going to say who wrote Matthew, but um, how do we know who wrote Matthew? Anyone know why we attribute Matthew to this gospel? Because it's not written anywhere, you know, it's not like Luke or Paul's letters. So why do we attribute Matthew to Matthew? Because he was a tax collector and he had paper? No. All right, for, for no other reason than tradition, all right? Because traditionally, um, it's attributed to Matthew. And in fact, both uh, Matthew, Mark, and... Yeah, no, Matthew and Mark, um, there's no reason why we, why we can, with any sense of surety, say that they wrote those books. It is basically just tradition. Um, even the name... Matthew, it's not on any manuscript or any title. It was actually referenced by that first phrase, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That's how it was, was referred to um, in the very, very first uh, mentionings or recordings of sermons that have been found, apparently. All right, so the author, Matthew the Apostle, do you deny the reason and tradition and early, uh, really uncontested tradition? There's no one that's proposed anyone else as the author that makes any sense whatsoever. So we're going to assume that Matthew is the author for the purpose of this book. Um, it is actually anonymous. The original composition would not have included the title, which is what I made reference to. Instead, the opening verse functioned as the title. And although it's unclear whether 1-1 one, one was intended to introduce the genealogy alone or to work as the title because... Uh, that's how books were written in those days, that the first line was really the title of the book um, or the letter. So whether or not it was intended to be that way or as a genuine introduction to the genealogy that was about to follow, um, in Greek the phrase could mean a record of ancestors of Jesus the Messiah or an account of the origins of Jesus the Messiah or the book of the beginnings of Jesus the Messiah, or roughly saying the same thing, really. But really what the point that the commentator is making in that particular passage is uh, that line fits congruently with how the letters were structured in the first century. The first line was the normally the title of the letter of the book. Um, after the four Gospels were collected as a group, um, in the second century, titles were added to distinguish them from one another. And there are slight variations, uh, but generally uh, the titles in the Greek manuscript are the same, which are according to, and then Matthew, and Mark, Luke, and John, which is if you, if you have a Greek translation, you'll often see that word. Oops. Oh, I forgot my mouse doesn't come up there. That word, kata, which means according to... Um, so, and then the person's name. So if you, if you have a Greek manuscript, that's what will be in the top, all in capital letters. Um, and that's basically just how they started identifying the book. All right. So Q-text versus Mark as a source. So Q-text basically just is a short version of saying the Quirrell text or something like that. And it's a German word 
meaning source. Um, and so my opinion, and this is just my opinion, and I think almost the majority, uh, because I really can't find an absolute majority, but the majority of people believe that Mark is a source for Matthew. Um, and they also believe that there is this Q text out there somewhere, or this Quirla text out there somewhere that acts as a source that, both, that all three Gospels, Mark, Luke, and Matthew used to sort of fill in the blanks um, where, they all, um, where they're all the same. If not, then, if not, if not having used Mark, uh, my opinion is that Matthew was written first. And I've actually always been of that opinion right from before I even knew that there was a, a Q text theory and uh, right before I knew that the reason, well, that the reason that some commentators say it's the first book in the Bible because it was written first. The reason why it's always been my opinion is because generally when you copy someone's work, you shorten it. You don't make it longer. So why would you take Mark, which is a short, compact, concise book, and then write an expose off it? Whereas it would make more sense if you were Mark and not an apostle that you would take an apostle's work and then re- Gurgitate or rehash that work in a summarized version to produce the intention that you're writing your book for. So that's always just been my opinion. You may believe as you wish. It doesn't make any difference as to how you interpret the book at all. Um, so the date, obviously this date will depend on what you believe. If you believe Mark was the source or the Kirela text is the source, you'd have to date it around 64 to, to 70 AD because that's when Mark's book was written and that's roughly dated on the information he uses based on the events of the time and the history of Jerusalem and its falling and what he says and does not say about it. So if you believe that, then you'd, you'd have it in the latter part of that window. Um, some commentators even have it as early as AD 35. I think that's a stretch. Most scholars believe that the earliest book in the Bible wouldn't have been written before AD 50. So... I just, well, 80, 40 to 80, 70, depending on what, you, what your thoughts are on that matter. So really, no real divine date, nothing that we have to specifically pin it down. Uh, I've already commented that. Oh, here's another question for you that I thought I'd ask. Anyone know what language or want to tell me what language or guess what language Matthew was written in? Greek? Hebrew? Greek? All right. So... Sorry? Mandarin. Mandarin? Well, I know that one's wrong. That's the only one I'm ready. So, again, I, I, I didn't know this. Yeah? Whatever language you're looking at on your computer. Whatever language. <laughs> so, I believe, personally, I believe it would have been Greek. Um, for no other reason than it was the most common language at the time. And as we've just heard, even in the... And the silence, well, sorry, the ladies wouldn't have heard it, but the silence between the Testament studies that the men have just done, it was, I actually found it very interesting. I thought I'd find it boring, to be honest, but I was really interested in, in every lesson. The men did a great job of making that interesting, for me anyway. And it was just so interesting to see how God worked with these nations between the Testaments to actually arrive where Christ arrived and the, the political climate, the language and everything that was going on. It was just, it was actually really faith building for me and just to see that God's always been in control. And especially today, there's so many crazy theories about all these things that are going on today and what the world's coming to. And, you know, we look back and it's, it's all been done before. It's all been before. It's, it's probably going to all come again. So those theories are probably correct, but it's the bottom line is it's, it's been before. There's nothing new in, under the sun. Um, and so... I suppose in talking about theories, there's some people that say it was written in Hebrew or Aramaic because Matthew was writing to the Jews. I believe it was written in Greek because of the political climate, time, and the audience. The Jewish most common language would not have been Aramaic. It would have been Greek at that time. But you're welcome to your own opinion as well. Um, actually, interestingly enough, all the commentators agree that all, every other book in the New Testament is written in Greek. There's only this dispute on whether or not Matthew was written in Hebrew or Aramaic as opposed to Greek. All right, so uh, the purpose, seeing we're still on the traditional introduction for the book. Um, so it's 
though the precise occasion of the writing is not known, it appears that Matthew had at least two reasons, and I'm going to say seven because I've got another five from another author that I thought was slightly more detailed. But I did enjoy these two that I didn't want to just ignore them. So the one commentator said um, had at least two reasons. So one, he wanted to show um, unbelieving Jews that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. So reason number one, prove that Christ was the Messiah and that he had come uh, through Abraham and David and he wanted others to come to that same belief and relationship with Jesus. Um, but of course... What's the natural implication of that? If Jesus Christ is the Messiah, exactly what happened when Peter preached that gospel, the unbelieving Jews that wanted to believe would be faced with that incredible dilemma that, well, uh-oh, we've just crucified the Messiah. So the second reason for Matthew is, you know, reason number one, to convince the Jewish nation that Jesus was the Messiah. But reason number two was to encourage them and to say, you know, it's not all lost. All hope is not lost. Yes, he was the Messiah. Yes, you crucified him. But God has a plan. God had a plan. And God always will have a plan. And if they repent, they could come into that kingdom and basically to show the Jewish nation that he was not finished with them as a nation, um, but wanted them to be the, the new Israel. Um, I enjoyed this commentator's uh, uh, reasoning as well. So he, write, he said that the purpose of Matthew was, one, wanted to convince the non-Christian Jews of the truth. So we read that one. Uh, sought to explain to Christians how their religion is, fulfill, is a fulfillment of God's prophecy and patterns of activities in the Old Testament. So I think that's, that's really one, a key thing. I don't think you can leave that out of the purpose of Matthew. He uses, as we've looked at already, over 130 uh, references to the Old Testament. So that was obviously something that was key in Matthew's mind and purpose for his writing. And he wanted to give young believers basic instruction in Christian living. Uh, we see that in the recording of many or many in his recording in Jesus' sermon. So, uh, and the full sermons is what I was trying to say. So, you know, the Beatitudes and uh, Matthew. I used to remember when I was a kid and I didn't have any understanding of uh, well, I didn't have a great understanding of the Bible. I used to love Matthew because there was so much red writing in it. All right, But that is, what does that mean to a mature audience? That means that it's a lot of recording of Jesus' teaching. So he want, Matthew wanted to get that across. Um, he wanted to encourage his church in the midst of persecution. And he desired to deepen the Christian faith by supplying more details around Jesus' words and works. All right, so I just thought I'd add this in as a, as a quick relationship to the other Gospels. So the reason they're called the Synoptic Gospels is Synoptic means point of view. And so, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are different ways of viewing the same life and the same message. So there, I found this little um, table, if, you, if I can call it that, or these few bullet points, um, and naming the relationship with the other Gospels quite interesting. So Matthew's primary relationship uh, as we'll see as we go through that uh, Jesus Christ is the king that was to come, the prophesied king and the son of David. And really, we see that in, in 1 verses 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It was the fulfillment of the prophecy that God made to Abraham. And even in, in looking at that or considering that, I found it really interesting. So as I said, I'm in Genesis and I'm around 20 to 27. Those few chapters is where I'm busy and it's it really when I was putting the study together, I was thinking how important it was for uh, Sarah not to be with any of the kings that she found herself with before, uh, before Isaac came along. And um, I never really paid much attention to that. And I said, oh, Abraham, and we we're so focused on the lying portion of it. And why did he do it? And did he have to do it? that we forget how important it was that she actually remained apart from them because of the controversy that could have come in that, well, was Isaac Abraham's son or was, she not Abraham, was he not Abraham's son? Um, and so I found, um, even with um, when he's talking to, uh, I think it's Abimelech, and he says, you're a dead man. Well, why? I, I didn't do anything. I didn't even know her. And I, and I did it in the integrity of my heart. And he said, yes, I know. If you don't give her back, you and your whole household are going to die. Because it was very important that Sarah remain pure. Similarly, almost to obviously Mary, 
remain pure and Joseph not knowing Mary because of the implications that could have come out of there. So, um, very important passage and um, I think a great opening for the New Testament. Talking straight away as we come from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we see the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. All right, so traditionally, um, or sorry, not traditionally, transitionally, um, Matthew's structure is broken into three very high level. I was actually going to break it down into further detail, but I thought, oh, just we'll get lost in all the detail of it, and we're going to go through it anyway, so it didn't provide too much detail. But um, at a very high level, the book is broken out into three main uh, sections, and uh, besides the first section, which obviously opens within the, uh, not in the beginning, which opens with um, Jesus, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Uh, the second and third sections all begin with that phrase, from that time on Jesus began to. So we obviously have the first section which talks about the preliminary, preliminary events leading up to Jesus' public ministry, including his ancestry, which is obviously in chapter 1, uh, his infancy and his baptism and then temptations, and then that leads into his public ministry. Uh, and that section includes his deeds, his teachings, and his conflicts with authorities. And then the last section is pretty much leading up to his crucifixion. So from that time on is what kicks us off in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Um, oh, sorry. It's, yeah, well, I've got the wrong verse there. Let's figure that one out. But anyways, the, um, so when Jesus came into the region of Philippi, he asked his disciples, and then from then on, it talks about leading him to the rejection and the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, sorry, it actually does say that. So the episode at Caesarea Philippi sets up the section and the prediction that he will suffer. And this rejection ultimately culminates in his crucifixion. So we'll actually just end it there. I'll give us an early night tonight. Um, and then next week we will... Um, We'll go through uh, probably chapter 1 and chapter 2 because chapter 1 is almost wholly taken up by the genealogy of Christ, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. Um, I was thinking about just doing it now. I probably could. Let's just do chapter 1. All right, so if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, um, which reads, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Amenadab, and Amenadab begot Nahshon. Nahshon begot Solomon. Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, and Manasseh begot Ammon, Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. After they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Abiud, Abiud begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Iliad. Iliad begot Eleazar, and Eleazar begot Mathan. Mathan begot Jacob, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. So <clears throat> just a couple of points to note on that. I'm not going to labor it too much. Um, for those of you who are really good and really quick accounting or have got your own notes in there, uh, you will learn that from Abraham to David is indeed 14, from David to the Babylonian um, exile is indeed 14, and then from the Babylonian exile to Jesus is only 12, or potentially 13, 
depending on how you want to count the Babylonian exile, but of course it then gives you a heartache on the other side of that equation. Um, so, in short, not in short, the one uh, son there, so Zerubbabel begot uh, Abiad, no, sorry, Shealtiel. So in verse 12, uh, Jack and I begot Shealtiel, then Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. So if you're really good with your Old Testament history, there is one name that's missed out there. So that's what some commentators say. Well, that's the 14. So that makes it 14, 14, 14. But then you'll say, well, why was he missed out? And I'll say, well, I have no idea. Um, rarely the structure that Matthew is trying to put together there is that it's a perfect framework and structure as per the promise of God to establish that with the Jews. Now, I do not know and I have never been able to find a satisfactory answer as to exactly why some are left out and some are not left out. And I'll leave you to read all the commentators either that if it is something that really um, burns away at you. Um, but in short, what we have recorded is 14 generations from each of the major events through all the promises to ultimately wind up with Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And obviously 14 was a significant number, the number of seven twice. And even when we looked at Genesis and when we looked at Revelation, I remember actually Sean's lessons because he kept doing all those quizzes on what all the numbers meant, right? And two meant to confirm something. So we have seven twice, so it's confirmed twice over um, in each of the frameworks that this was God's hand and this was God's promise. So the number 14 held significant to the Jews and therefore... Matthew wrote and structured this genealogy to fit in with that framework. Um, and, you know, some, when, I was, when I was younger, I remember that it did sort of burn in Norway at my curiosity. Why doesn't it make sense? Why is it this? Because I'm very detail-orientated. Um, but something that sort of, uh, not played on me, but something that I came to realize was it's interesting that none of the early churches really questioned that. There's, there's, they just accepted it because they've read, they, they understood. And when I say early churches, I don't mean 1600s. I mean the early church um, of you know, the first and second century churches. They accepted it for what it is. And that to me has always been a great proof even of Christ being resurrected. You know, why? It's one thing to today question well, if Christ was resurrected because it happened to 2,000 odd years ago and there's, there's just nothing anybody can do to say either yay or nay to that. But at the time when Christianity was, when Christianity was at its peak of persecution, the one thing that was never questioned was whether or not Christ was risen from the dead or the um, authenticity of the testimony of these uneducated men. In fact, their, um, that always just stood in their stead and their integrity just always stood as their own witness to their testimony. So I don't quite fully grasp the Jewish nuances in that, and I haven't been able to in, in my studies. And even the commentators, I've never been fully happy with um, the reasons they've provided, which all just base around the number 14 is relevant to the Jews. Some of them talk about the, his, the lives of the people that were left out and not, and, uh, and none of that sort of holds, makes any major weight with me. Um, nevertheless, we arrive at Jesus within the framework um, operated by Matthew and the Jewish custom of the time. So just to finish off um, with Christ born of Mary. Now the birth of Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, they came together and she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child. And bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife. And he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So again, 
as mentioned earlier, we see the importance of that last verse, really. He did not know her until she had brought forth his firstborn son. The reason being that there would be no dispute that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin by the hand of God through his prophecy. And I think we'll conclude it then, conclude it there. Any questions or comments on any of that? All righty, we'll kick off with chapter two next week. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Holy Father and mighty God, what an awesome, awesome God you are. And we thank you that we have the privilege of reading from your word the truth of what happened many, many years ago, that you loved this world so much you sent your son to this world to be our savior, to be our teacher, to be our king, to be our Christ, and to pay for our sins. We thank you, Father, for your plan that was worked through all generations from Adam right on to Mary, bringing forth your son. And Father, we are just in awe of your plan and of your wisdom and of your absolute control over this world and all its events. And we submit ourselves wholly to you, Father, that your will be done in our lives, for we know that you are the great I am who was, who is, and who forever will be. And that by submitting to you, Father, we will have joy and peace on this earth, in your church and in your kingdom, whether that be physical or spiritual uh, peace we know that it will for sure be spiritual peace but in the turmoil and, and strife that is out in this world I pray that we hold fast to your teaching that we may experience eternal joy in your presence when you come again we look so forward to that day father we pray for it to come we pray for your coming to this world and collecting your saints but until then lord I pray that we be found doing your work and for your hand of blessing over this church and over your church as a whole through the world. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.